Hoş geldiniz. Üsküdar Üniversitesi İnsan ve Toplum Bilimleri Fakültesi'nin Politik Psikoloji Araştırma Merkezi ve Oxford, Oxford Üniversitesi işbirliği ile gerçekleştirilen Krizdeki Dünya, Jeopolitik Riskler ve Fırsatlar başlıklı etkinliği kapsamında bugün Michigan Üniversitesi Gerald Ford Kamu Politikaları Okulu ve Oxford Üniversitesi Çözümlenemeyen Çatışmaların Çözümü Araştırma Merkezi'nden Sayın Profesör Dr. Scott Atrid ve Sayın Profesör Dr. Robert Axelrod ile e, yine aynı araştırma merkezinden ve Arizona Üniversitesi'nden Dr. Richard Davis ile Üsküdar Üniversitesi Kurucu Rektör ve Yönetim Kurulu Başkanı Sayın Profesör Dr. Nezat Arhun hocamız konuşma yapacaklardır. Misafirlerinize Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ne hoş geldiniz diyoruz. Üniversitemizin İnsan ve Toplum Bilimleri Fakültesi Dekanı Sayın Profesör Doktor Deniz Ülke Arıboğan ve Lord John Elderdice Ankara'daki resmi bir toplantıları nedeniyle ne yazık ki konferansa katılamamışlardır. Üniversite Kültürü dersi kapsamında olan etkinliğimiz boyunca simultane çeviri yapılacaktır. Bu nedenle katılımcıların etkinliği Türkçe takip etmeleri mümkün olacaktır. İlk olarak sözü üniversitemizin kurucu rektör ve yönetim üst kurulu başkanı Sayın Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan hocamıza etkinliğin açılış konuşmasını yapmak üzere vermek istiyoruz. Hocamızı kürsüyü teşrif etmeye davet ediyoruz. Evet, değerli misafirler, ee, sayın hocalarım, sevgili öğrenciler, e, bu güzel e, etkinliğe dünyanın en çok ihtiyacı olduğu bir zamanda ve en çok e, işe yarayacağı bir zamanda bu güzel e, etkinliği yapmak bizim için büyük bir e, onur ve sevinç e, vesilesi oldu. E, gelen e, misafirlerimiz e, Michigan Üniversitesi'nden, e, Oxford'dan, ee, ve e, Arizona e, Üniversitesi'nde ve Üsküdar Üniversitesi'yle birlikte olarak dünyadaki krizi e, dünyadaki kri, krizle ilgili çözüm olarak e, ne gibi çözümler düşünebilir, ne gibi fırsatlar var bununla ilgili bir şeyler e, e, üretmek istiyoruz. Çünkü dünyanın e, özellikle şu anda dünyanın en çok ihtiyacı olan nedir? bunu iyi bilmek gerekir. Bir kısa vadeli çözümler vardır. Orta vadeli ve uzun vadeli çözümler vardır. Burada daha önce benim de toplantılarında bulunduğum Oxford'da bulunduğum Crick Çatışma Çözüm Merkezi internetçi ve burada şu anda Ankara'da olan değerli Crick üyesi Lord Alderdice İran'ın İrlanda'da İrlanda, Kuzey İrlanda'da senelerce süren bir ciddi bir iç savaş niteliğinde bir çatışma vardı. Bu çatışmayı çözümünde büyük önlem olan ve daha sonra dört ünvanında verilen Alderdaz bir psikiyatrist, psikiyatri uzmanıydı. Ve Krik Uluslararası çözüm e, merkezinin kurucularından ya da e, onun aktif üyelerinde e, e, Vamuk Volkan e, Profesör Vamuk Volkan da bir meslektaşımızdı. E, bu nedenle e, birçok ülkedeki problemin çözümüne katkı sağladılar. E, ben e, buradaki toplantının e, bu çözümde bir e, trafik işareti gibi bir yol gösterici olabileceğini düşünüyorum. E, bununla ilgili e, yapılabilecek e, birçok şey var muhakkak. Şimdi dünyada üç türlü bizim bildiğimiz kriz var. Birincisi ekonomik kriz olarak biliyoruz. E, diğeri siyasi krizler biliyoruz. Ama daha önemli bir kriz var ki bence orta ve uzun vadeli sonucu olan bir kriz ki insan hakları krizi. Bu insan hakları krizi konusunda e, de bir şeyler e, söylemek gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Çünkü 20. 20. yüzyıl, 21. yüzyılın insanlığın geldiği medeniyette insanlığın yeni kutsalları insan hakları. 
Yani insanlığı insan yapan ve insanın bir arada yaşamasını sağlayacak olan insan hakları İkinci Dünya Savaşı'ndan sonra Birleşmiş Milletler işte beyannamesi şeklinde bir nevi tescil edildi, bir nevi doğrulandı. Bunu korumazsak eğer dünya yaşanılmaz hale gelir. Dünyanın daha yaşanılır hale gelebilmesi için dünyanın bu insan haklarının bir kutsal değer gibi sahip çıkılması gerekiyor. Şu, şu durumda da insan hakları ile ilgili ciddi tartışmalar yaşanıyor. Bu krizlerden özellikle bir Orta Doğu'daki krizi şu anda biliyoruz. Aktif bir bölgesel bir savaş var. E şimdi bu normalde savaşlarda sivil ölümü yüzde beş ondur savaşlarda. Ama burada sivil ölümü yüzde altmış yetmiş ve bunu durdurulamıyor bu. E bu da bir e, şu anda yüzde altmış yetmiş kadın çocuk e, ve e, insanların ölmesi e, burada ne savaş hukuklu açıklanabilir ne in, uluslararası hukuklu açıklanabilir bir durum. E, bu nedenle bu, bu konuda da e, bir e, Buradan çık, yani bu tehdit boyutunu bilemiyoruz. Biz e, burada siyasi çözümden e, e, daha e, ö, benim öncelikle gördüğüm insan hakları sisteminin dünyada zarar görmemesini sağlamak ve bunun bunun için burada ne gibi bir fırsatlar ortaya çıkarabileceğiz? Yani i̇nsanlığın daha iyiye gitmesi için neler yapabileceğiz? Benim ülkem daha iyiye gitsin değil. Benim bölgem daha iyiye gitsin değil. İnsanlık daha iyiye gitsin diye düşünmemiz gerekiyor. Her ülke kendisinin daha iyiye gitmesini düşünürse ne olur? E, etnik bir, e, bir nevi e, e, burada e, ben merkezci bir yaklaşım olur. Bir, e, sadece kendi çıkarını düşünen insanlardan oluşan bir aile düşünün. O ailede huzur olmaz. E, sadece kendi çıkarılan ülkeler, devletler düşünün. O devletlerin olduğu ortamda huzur olmaz. O için huzur olması için güven oluşması lazım. Yani nasıl aile için çatışmalarda biz güven oluşturucu önlemler düşünüyorsak bir ailede, bir şirkette bu e, uluslararası ilişkilere de güven oluşturmamız gerekiyor. E, benim e, daha önce de e, bu, e, söylemeye çalıştığım bir şey var. Birleşmiş Milletler'in dünya parlamentosu gibi olması. Dünya parlamentosu gibi olması. Yani Diyelim nasıl bir demokratik sistemler ne var? Bir ülkede parlamento var. Toplumdaki her katman orada tesmin, temsil ediliyor. Ve o temsiliyet içerisinde herkes e, e, kavga etmeden, savaşmadan, şiddet uygulamadan hakkını arıyorlar ve bir diyalog oluşuyor. E, e, en büyük e, en büyük düşmanımız ön yargı, en büyük ihtiyacımız da diyalog. E, ön yargıları nasıl dağıtacağız? İletişim kurarak dağıtacağız, konuşarak dağıtacağız. E, dünyadaki sorunlar içinde Birleşmiş Milletler'in e, her milletin temsil edildiği ve e, adil bir işleyiş içerisinde olması, dünya parlamentosu gibi çalışması e, dünyayı daha yaşanılır yapar diye düşünüyorum. Ve şu anda bu e, dünyadaki sistemde ciddi bir ahlaki başarısızlık var şu anda ahlaki baş, çifte standart var. Ahlaki başarısızlık var. Bu başarısızlık sonucunda güven zayıflıyor. Güven zayıfladığı zaman çatışma artar. Güvenin zayıfladığı yerde korku ortaya çıkıyor. Korkunun orduyu yerde de herkes yaşam kalım mücadelesi vermeye başlıyor. Korkuyu azaltmak için muhakkak güven odaklı çalışmalar gerekir. Yani fosfor alevlerinin havada uçuştuğu bir ortamda bizim burada buna düşünüp çözüm üret, üretmemiz gerekir diye düşünüyorum. Ve bunun kurbanlarının özellikle çocuklar olduğu bir ortamda. Biz üniversite olarak bu konuda uzun yıllardır çalışmalar yapıyoruz. Politik psikoloji araştırma uygulama merkezimiz var. Bir şeyler yapmaya çalışıyor. İşte Deniz Ülke Hocam'ın şu anda liderliğinde. Diğer postkolonyal çalışmalar merkezimiz var. Postkolonyal, postkolonyal çalışmalar merkezimiz yani kolonyalizm bittikten sonra ikinci dünyadan savaşından sonra doğu ve batı medeniyetinin çatışmaması lazım. Medeniyet savaşları olmaması lazım. Bunun için neler yapılmalı? Bunu çalış, bunu çalışmıyor. Yani bunu bununla ilgileniyor. Bunun için bu postkolonyal çalışmalar ve politik psikoloji çalışmalar içerisinde benim burada yani 
bizim Üsküdar Üniversitesi Senatosu'nda da önermek istediğim, eğer buradaki misafirlerimiz de uygun görür, kabul ederse, burada e, bu, özellikle küresel barış ve insan hakları konusunda bir manifesto yayınlayabilirsek, bu manifesto içerisinde biz e, burada dünyada e, dünyanın daha yaşanılır olabilmesi için, dünyanın daha e, e, yani silah lobilerinin etkisinden kurtulabilmesi için topyekün dünyada bir ciddi bir farkındalık gerekiyor. O farkındalık olursa ancak burada toplumdan talep olursa bazı şeyler düzelir. Yoksa e, güç savaşları, ego savaşları hiç bitmez. Bu nedenle toplumsal farkındalık bu açıdan çok önemli. Dünyanın yeni bir medeniyet savaşına girmemesi gerekiyor. Doğu medeniyetiyle Batı medeniyet arasında gerilim yaşatmak isteyenler var. E, bir güven oluşması gerekir ki bu medeniyet çatışması olmaması gerekir. Onun için böyle lafta kalmamalı medeniyet çatışmaları. Ama bunun için e, güvenli ilişkiler olması, açık, şeffaf, dürüst ilişkiler olması gerekiyor. E, ve e, ötekileştirme, ayrımcılık yapılmaması gerekiyor. İnşallah ben bu şeyin e, e, bu, bu bugünkü toplantıdan da e, işte biz e, üniversitemizdeki ilgili merkezlerin e, uygun görmesi halinde bu konudaki bir Manifesto ile bir kendi çapımızda bir katkı sağlamak istiyoruz ve e, bu e, her e, te, tehlikenin tehdit boyutu vardır, bir de fırsat boyutu vardır. Tehdit boyutunu e, çözmek için gerekenler yapılıyor ama fırsat boyutu olarak neler yapılabilir? E, biz e, burada e, dünyada e, karar vericiler, karar vericilere yön verenler, bu konuda üniversiteleri bilgi üretir, ürettiği bilgileri bilim insanın akışına sunar. Bu akış içerisinde o bilgilere uygun o bilgilere uygun çözümler üretilebilir. İnşallah ben ümit ediyorum Krik ve buradaki değerli hocalarımız her biri Robert Scott hepsi çok bu konularda kafa yormuş kişiler. Onun için onların görüşleri bize katkı sağlayacak. Kendilerine burada teşrif ettikleri için teşekkür ediyorum. Size de başarılı bir toplantı diliyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Nevzat Hocamıza konuşması için çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Şimdi değerli konuklarımızı sahneye teşrife davet ediyoruz. Welcome uh, you once again uh, to our conference, World in Crisis, uh, Geopolitics, Risks and Opportunities, co-organized by the Political Psychology Center at Üsküdar University and Center for, uh, Center for Resolution of Intractable Conflict, CRIC, at Oxford University. And in such a crisis-ridden world, I don't think that we need lengthy explanations and justifications uh, to make sense of our topic today. Uh, for humanity is in the midst of uh, a multifaceted crisis, or at least a sense of crisis, uh, not only in strictly and purely geostrategic terms, but uh, in a variety of fields, uh, let's say in the human condition in general. Uh, on the one hand, new power constellations uh, are challenging uh, the current international order by um, by deepening in inherent fault lines and sparking new armed conflicts in Syria, in uh, Eastern Europe, and most recently, of course, in Israel and Palestine. Uh, and furthermore, the technological developments, uh, such as the advent of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, raise serious philosophical uh, dilemmas and, in fact, even an ethical uh, you know, crisis uh, about what it means to be a human. Or perhaps most fundamentally, uh, the ecological crisis makes us anxious about our future as a species, uh, about, about the very physical survival of the human beings. So fortunately, human beings are not only fragile victims of the ways the world operates, 
uh, but uh, potent agents who can interfere. And as scientists, uh, we can be helpful by analyzing the world in crisis, both with its risks and opportunities. Uh, we can create and share knowledge that will help us manage the crisis, as well as imagine and inspire new norms, new values and collaborations for a more peaceful and meaningful life on this planet, I think. And fortunately, again, we are joined today by three uh, very distinguished uh, scholars and pro uh, professors who are uh, more than capable of pro providing us with an extensive understanding of the world crisis and you know, new perspectives uh, on the current crisis. So I'd like to give them the floor without wasting any more of your time. And uh, our method will be, uh, Professor Axelrod uh, is going to give you a speech and then uh, two other contributors, uh, Professor Scott Atron and uh, Dr. Richard Davis is going to make some comments and contributions and criticisms, I guess. And then we will uh, let you ask your answers or make your contributions. I want to uh, remind you of the fact that once again that, that we have uh, you know, uh, simultaneous interpretation. So uh, the, uh, the students uh, who cannot express themselves very fluently in English, uh, please do not uh, hesitate uh, from asking uh, questions or making your own comments. Well, uh, before, giving, uh, before turning the floor over to uh, our uh, dear uh, colleagues, uh, I want to, uh, you know, uh, introduce them very briefly uh, to you without wasting your time, as I said. Uh, okay, Professor Robert Axelrod is a senior fellow at the uh, CRIC and uh, what? and William D. Hamilton Distinguished University Professor Emeritus at the University of Michigan. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and former president of the American Political Science Association. He is also the winner of several national uh, awards. Uh, his areas of spe specializations include international security, formal models, and complex adaptive systems. Uh, his work focuses on questions of how patterns of social behavior emerges, uh, emerge, uh, and he draws on the current research in a wide range of disciplines, including biology, psychology, and computer science. Then, uh, Professor Scott Atron is a co-founder of CRIC at Oxford University and Artists International, a research professor at the University of Michigan's Gerald Ford School of Public Policy, research fellow at Oxford University's Changing Character of War Center, Emeritus Director of Research at France Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, I guess. If I made my homework correctly, and advisor to the UN Security Council on Counterterrorism and Issues of Youth, Peace, and Security. His research interests include the way scientists and ordinary people characterize, categorize, and reason about nature, on the cognitive and evolutionary psychology of religion, and on the limits of rational choice in political and cultural conflict. And finally, Richard Davis, uh, Dr. Richard Davis is Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Artists International. Uh, he holds several active appointments, which include Founding Fellow of the Center for the Resolution of CRIC at the University of Oxford, uh, Senior Research Fellow uh, at Paris uh, Manchester College, University of Oxford, uh, senior Research Associate at the Center for International Studies, Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford, I guess. Uh, Richard, uh, he served at, uh, at the White House as the Director of Prevention uh, Policy Terrorism. Uh, he has authored and co-authored articles and publications on energy, international security, political violence and terrorism. So. Uh, that's it, I guess. And uh, dear Professor Axelrod, please. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here today uh, to see you and to uh, have a chance to talk about the world in crisis. My plan is to speak about 15 minutes, then my colleagues will explain to you what I said that was incorrect, then we will have a chance uh, to interact with you folks. I want to start with climate change. This, this picture is a very good illustration of the problem. Usually in international affairs we worry about nations, but there's the global problem, as you know, 
of climate change, where the world is getting hotter and less livable, and the nations have made many commitments, and they have not honored those commitments, and therefore the situation is getting worse year by year. Already uh, in Turkey, you can see, as you've experienced, uh, forest fires, drought, flooding, and soon to be a pre realized ocean rise, which will cause even more problems. These are global problems and they exist locally as well. And the world has not yet found a way to cope with them and stop the deterioration that in your lifetimes will be very severe. Now I'd like to turn to some national problems. Let me start with China and its relationship with the United States. China, as you know, is a country that is still asserting its role in the world. It is deeply affected by the Western imperialism of the 19th century, and which um, destroyed its previous um, role as the center of its own world for many centuries. So it is regarded as the Middle Kingdom. The West destroyed that role, and then since about 1950, it has been rebuilding. And it is still asserting its role, and, um, and of course its economic growth has been very substantial, although recently slowed somewhat. This has created a rivalry with the United States, which of course since World War II is the strongest country in the world, and the confrontation, sometimes uh, cooperative and sometimes hostile between the United States and China, is one of the most important relationships in the world today, and no doubt will be for decades to come. It has several aspects. One, of course, is economic competition, where until recently, there was a great deal of mutual cooperation and mutual gain from trade, which helped China. In fact, it helped limit, uh, reduce world poverty by the hundreds of millions of people that were raised from poverty in China and so also comparably in India. And the United States, of course, benefited as well as the rest of the world from Chinese prosperity. But more recently, especially in the last five years or so, the relationship economically has become much more uh, ambiguous where the United States, for example, has uh, uh, distinguished itself uh, from uh, unlimited co economic cooperation and is trying to maintain more self-sufficiency. And China, as well, is asserting its own uh, abilities to uh, maintain its uh, growth and development without um, undue reliance on the rest of the world. The single most important challenge is Taiwan, which as you know is a separate political unit that China regards as part of its country. The United States has accepted that um, um, position. On the other hand, it lives effectively as an independent country. And China, up till now, has been willing to put the problem off indefinitely. But in recent years, they say they do not want to put it off indefinitely. It at some point should be solved. But there's no effective way to solve it because um, uh, uh, Taiwan uh, no longer regards it as feasible to work out a um, understanding of two states of one, I mean, two, two, politi two, two economic situations within one country. In particular, what happened in Hong Kong makes that um, um, in, in, impossible. So that is a, a constant problem, which um, so far has not exploded. But there have been tensions more directly on the periphery, in particular in the South China Sea, where China is asserting its right to um, control the entire South China Sea. The United States with uh, Vietnam, Philippines, Japan, 
has resisted that, and it's uh, it's it's a frontier of uh, possibilities of um, uh, un of unexpected conflict. Russia, of course, is another major issue in international affairs, in particular its relation with other countries. Russia, as you know, is a um, a country that is deeply dissatisfied with its role in the world. Since the Soviet Union collapsed, the Russian state has been, no longer been one of the major uh, bipolar countries, and it has been asserting itself on the border. And of course, contemporary, the current situation is most intense since its invasion of Ukraine. That situation is uh, ongoing as a major conflict. It, uh, it is uh, not clear how it is going to develop. In the short run, it's almost a stalemate, but Russia uh, is asserting its uh, economic and uh, population abilities to overwhelm the smaller country of Ukraine, which is very dependent on assistance from the United States and Europe the assistance is no longer um, to be taken for granted, and therefore the situation is likely in the next few months um, to undergo substantial change. Let me also say that the United States itself is undergoing change. The situation is that democracy in the United States is under threat. The political system has become very polarized with people on the left and right disputing almost everything and having great difficulty cooperating. In my view, the, pot, the, po the potential of former President Trump to be reelected would be a disaster for the world. And the, um, the gains of right-wing parties in parts of Europe are also a threat to democracy in many places. And it's not clear how that is going to be uh, developed, but it's certainly a, uh, a danger to not only the domestic uh, with, um, uh, situations in, the, in these countries, but also the international situations as to um, what role, for example, the United States will be playing um, as um, as this polarization continues and as its um, active role in the rest of the world is under question. Finally, I want to say a word about the entire globe. The nation state is now obsolete. The system, of course, is organized as a society of nation states, but it is no longer able to deal with many of the problems such as climate change, or um, health problems that cross borders, or these international conflicts. We um, are organized as a society of countries which declare their own sovereignty and respect each other's sovereignty is one of the major principles of international affairs. However, let me give you a definition of sovereignty. Sovereignty is the principle of irresponsibility. It is the principle that a country is not responsible to anybody else for its internal affairs. Nobody else can tell it how to run its own affairs. This is an unfortunate and dangerous situation. It is somewhat um, modified in recent years. For example, in South Africa, the world did not accept the way South Africa was an apartheid regime. It's also... Um, uh, asserting recently with the principle of responsibility to protect that as a country has a responsibility to protect its own citizens and otherwise the international community needs to um, to help uh, sustain health and, and, uh, and avoid um, famine. But more to the point, one of our major values in each country is patriotism. Loyalty to the state is a major value. That's a wonderful thing. States deliver um, um, for the most, except for failed states, they deliver peace and security, they deliver education and many services, and they deliver a sense of belonging and community. But I think 
as the world is in crisis, we need to think of ourselves as citizens of the world and not just citizens of the United States or Turkey or whatever. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Can you hear me? Well, I want to talk about something. I, there's a lot that Bob said. He gave you a general landscape of the geopolitical situation in the world today and for the immediate and interim future. And I want to give you an idea of the psychological and evolutionary substrate uh, of how we got to this position. So let me first say in um, answer to Dr. Uh, Neza about the idea of trust and peace and harmony in the world today, that human beings for most of their history that we know about, at least for the last 100 to 200,000 years, were defined by being um, the most predatory mammals on Earth. Uh, ever since their domination of animals, they've been predatory on their own species to an extent that no other animals or no other creatures uh, have been. And until the Enlightenment, really in the 18th century, uh, cannibalism, infanticide, oppression of women, oppression of minorities were the common fare of humanity. Then a bunch of intellectuals, uh, mostly European, but not all European, decided that torture, slavery, oppression should no longer be tolerable. We're still in the struggle to try to change those things. So there's nothing in humanity itself that is inherently peaceful. It takes a lot of work. It took centuries even of wars to bring us to the place where slavery and torture and oppression are no longer widely tolerated. The question is how much further can we advance? As Bob noticed, we are now divided into a system of nation states. Nation states are also quasi-religious organizations. They have banners, they have anthems, they have ceremonies, they demand sacrifice. In fact, the nation state is built on the idea that it is even stronger than the most primitive and important of all human relationships, which is their families. In the end, the nation state asks you to be able to even sacrifice your own kin. And this is something that's only happened for the first time in humanity uh, quite recently. But nation states continue in a very tribal mode. They're in constant competition, and this competition creates a quasi-anarchic system. And the way it is managed has always been very intermittent and very iffy. We are still in a very, very precarious situation in the world today. One of the things that always worries me, and that I think is even much more important than climate change, is the threat of nuclear war and nuclear annihilation. There is very little discussion of this among the publics of the world, even in those publics that have nuclear war, uh, nuclear weapons. There's almost no discussion, public discussion, so the public is almost unaware of the horrors it can produce. Within the first three minutes, we would expect between 90 and 180 million casualties. By the time the day is out, perhaps up to half humanity would disappear. The world wouldn't exist as we know it anymore. The United States and Russia alone have enough to destroy most of the world many times over. Each is on alert. The United States has strategic air command as does Russia, which means we have both airplanes and submarines armed with nuclear weapons ready to launch at any moment in time. And yet, if you read your newspapers, where the public discussions, or even at the universities, it's almost never mentioned. And there's more discussion of things in the United States, for example, of transgender bathrooms than there is of 
possibilities of nuclear holocaust. <coughs> the question is, how do we manage these things? Uh, Dr. Nevzat brought off the idea of a world system or a world government. Well, the problem with the world government is that Bertrand Russell, of course, and Albert Einstein brought that up in the 1950s when nuclear arms first came into public consciousness, and, but that didn't work very well. One of the problems with world government is for a world government to work, it has to have a monopoly of force. But who's going to give that the monopoly of force? In the discussion of who to give up force for this world government's monopoly of force, you're going to get the same tribal politics as you have today. To get out of the idea that the nation state is the center of everything, it's going to take many, many years. Just as the idea, for example, that cannibalism is wrong, or that slavery was wrong, or that bodily torture was wrong, or that racism was wrong. Again, human beings do have inherently racist tendencies, and for good reasons. At the beginning of humanity, when we were very much predatory, and each tribe suspected the other tribe, if you had a different accent, or a different hair color, or a different skin color, you had to make a very fast decision whether to fight, to flee, or to cooperate. So these external signs were very important in survival. Unfortunately, in today's world, they continue. And it takes quite a bit of education to overcome these kinds of almost innate prejudices. We have many other kinds of innate prejudices. We go to our own. I do experiments with my students at the university. I say, you guys are the orange guys, and you guys are the green guys. And by the end of the day, they are discriminating against one another in everything from ordering food to how they treat one another in the classroom. And it was completely arbitrary. I simply said, you're green and you're orange. And students and elite universities, highly educated, spontaneously organized themselves into competing tribes that were hostile to one another. So again, overcoming these tendencies requires constant vigilance and education, the kind of education you're receiving here, fortunately. But for the nation state, there is no educational system for this. The United Nations is, for many reasons, fairly weak. It's not as weak as the League of Nations were, unfortunately, because we do have a Security Council. People are talking about expanding the Security Council, but for the moment, at least, it keeps a lid on things like uh, nuclear war. Now I want to shift to something else, um, and that is um, how do conflicts start and how do they end? Since in, in 1939, when World War II began, the United States had 179,000 troops. They were 40th in the world in terms of a standing army. By the end of World War II, the United States produced more military capacity than the rest of the world combined because of a tremendous economic advantage they had. Since 1945, things have changed differently, but the United States still controls between 20 and 25 percent of the world's productive capacity, and China about 18 percent. The United States, together with Russia, mainly Russian manpower, were able to win the war against superior will. German fighters, and Japanese fighters were more motivated than either the Russians or the Americans or the Brits in World War II. They had been inculcated from a very young age to be part of a national movement that they truly believed in, however crazy it is, it was. The United States and Russia won the war because of overwhelming productive might. 
The Germans and the Japanese, no matter how much and willfully they wanted to struggle, just could not overcome the material advantage, which was tenfold by the time the war ended. Since then, the United States and Russia have based their idea of war and conflict on superior military capability, manpower and firepower. And this has been merged with the doctrine in philosophy and in economics and political science, as we know as rational choice theory, or theory of utility, where people weigh material costs and benefits and try to act in a way that maximizes their benefits but minimizes their costs. American military, economic, and political doctrine, just as Russian, is based on this view of the world and how human behavior is. But that's not the way, at least I think, human beings actually think and behave. Human beings think and behave on the basis of values they hold dear. If you look at the greatest sacrifices human beings made and have made throughout their history, it is not even for themselves, it's not for self-interest, it's not even for family or friends. It's for an idea of who they are and who I am. And this sacrifice for ideas, because ideas do change the world, and they change the world even more than military means. There is no natural cycle to civilizations rising and falling. Civilizations rise because of the value systems they have, and they fall because they lose faith in their own value systems. This is an insight that the great polymath Ibn Khaldun had six centuries ago. So what really motivates conflict in the long run? It is a conflict over how we think the world should be and our place in it. Currently, the United States, Russia, China, and believe it or not, Russia and China are still in competition with one another, um, interpret the world for the public in terms of territorial struggles. But never before in history has territorial struggle been so irrelevant. No one is going to invade China. China's borders are not in danger. For the first time in history, no one is thinking about invading Russia. The idea that the Ukrainians are going to invade Russia is actually ridiculous. And certainly no American thinks that they're going to invade Russia. And the idea that the United States would be territorially invaded is equally crazy. Yet, it's still framed in terms of a territorial struggle. It is not. The struggle between these great powers is a struggle for ideas and values. How do we fit in the world? How are our neighbors think about the world? And how do they think about us and who we are? Now, negotiations over material means, of costs and benefits of territory and manpower and firepower and weapons, these are easy. They're called business-like negotiations, and they are still the basis for most political negotiations in the world. But intractable conflicts of the kind our center is interested in can't be solved this way. Let's take, for example, the Israel-Palestine conflict. I'm often taken with an um, image by Isaac Dutcher, a philosopher of the left, who wrote shortly after the 1967 war in the New Left Review, imagine someone in a burning building. Their whole family is burned to death, and they're alone, perhaps with their child, and the only way out is to jump at the window. But passing underneath is another person with their parent, with their child, completely unaware of what's going on in the burning building. The person jumps out with their child onto the passerby, breaks their arms, breaks their legs. The person looks up and says, why have you done this to me? The person who jumps said, I had no choice. Both have the facts on their side. There is justice for both, and yet it seems to be irreconcilable. So how do we get past these kinds of conflicts? Conflict between Iran and the United States is similar. Well, 
one of the ways to do this is to explore not what material capabilities they have, not what firepower or manpower they have or how many nuclear bombs they have, but what values do they really believe in? What is important for them? If you don't recognize that, you'll never get to the stage where you can even have discussions about economic changes. So we did a set of experiments. We did an experiment with Israeli and Palestinian leaders. We visited the leaders of the Hamas in Amad. We talked to all of them. We stayed with their families. And we visited and talked over the years with the leaders of Israel as well. We also did experiments, both brain experiments and uh, behavioral experiments with Israelis and Palestinians. We took the census. Okay. Now, when you talk to leaders, you ask them to respond. Their next response will be influenced by their previous response. Okay. So this is called in psychology a within subjects design. There's a problem with that, but that's the only way you can treat leaders. You can't divide leaders into different groups. But for the population, you can. If you take the census, for example, and divide the population randomly into three different groups, then each group will not be affected by the answers of the other group, but you can give them different questions. That's called a between subjects design. So what we did was we took the census of Israel and the census of Palestine, we included all the settlers and all the refugees, and we divided each into three groups. In the first group we said, would you consider for each side, returning to the 1967 borders in exchange for a permanent peace. Neither side accepted it. About 80% on each side rejected it because of their histories, because of what they had been through. Then, the second group we asked, would you return to the 1967 borders if the European Union the United States and Russia would guarantee to each family the equivalent of 50,000 euros or $50,000 for the accommodation and provide the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli settler groups so many billions of dollars. Not only was the answer no, but opposition to a peace increased almost to ceiling. What was that telling us? That was telling us that these people, both populations, were not interested in the material aspects of this conflict. They were interested in something much deeper, again, in defining who they were. And the more we offered material compensation, the more violent they became. The more, for example, the Palestinians supported suicide bombing. And when you do brain experiments, of people who support suicide bombing, you find that revenge and joy occupy the same neural pathways. So, what was this telling us? It was telling us that economic theory, political theory, were pretty much wrong in terms of how humans behave and think about things like conflict. They don't think about material costs and benefits in the first instance. It's not the most important thing. They think about who they are, their ideas, their values, and what they truly care for. So the third group, we did something quite different. We said, would you accept a return to the 1967 borders? Same for Palestinian refugees, same for Israeli settlers, and same for the general population for the Palestinians if the Israelis apologized for the Nakba, for the catastrophe of 1948, without any promise of a return of refugees, but made a sincere apology. And Bob and I and Rich worked on these issues for quite some time with Palestinian and Israeli researchers. And what we found was even the settlers, the hardcore settlers, were much more willing to make a peace with the Palestinians. 
I mean, the Palestinians were much more interested in making a peace with the Israelis. Then we asked the settlers, would you accept a permanent peace along the 1967 borders if the Palestinian people and their leaders, including the Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, said, we are ready to allow the existence of Israel here in the Middle East. And opposition to peace went down significantly. Now think about it. No material offers whatsoever. An apology. That's all they wanted. Some recognition of who they are. We then went to the leaders. We went to Damascus. We interviewed the leaders. We provided the same issues. Again, it's a little bit different because they're affected by the previous answer they gave in these three alternatives. But what we found was, surprisingly, and they can testify, that, for example, Khalid Mashal, who is the chairman of the Hamas Politburo, when we went through this process, he said, yes, if the Israelis apologize, then we can talk. And then we asked him, would you consider a true peace, a permanent peace, Salah, not Hudna, not a truce, which is the standard position of the Hamas that will have a 10-year or 100-year truce, but then Israel will disappear. Would you accept a permanent Salah? Even his advisors were surprised when he said, yes, I think that is possible. We asked the same thing in the Knesset of Mr. Netanyahu. He gave us the same answer. But, he said, I would have to see all references to anti-Semitic literature expunged from Palestinian textbooks. And we would have to really be convinced. Both populations also agreed with these two scenarios. Both supported a two-state solution, massively. 70 to 80 percent at the time, Palestinians and Israelis supported a two-state solution back in 2007-2009. But then things collapsed. There was Hamas suicide bombing campaigns, there was Netanyahu and his problem of creeping annexation and settlement and playing off Hamas against the Palestinian Authority, even providing money to the Hamas so they would oppose the Palestinian Authority and prevent uh, a Palestinian state from emerging, and things have degenerated to the point that 17% of the Palestinians only believe that's even a possibility, and less than 30% of the Israelis believe that's a possibility. However, we also know that if trust can be built rapidly, a two-state solution comes rapidly to the fore of both populations, and both populations desire, earnestly desire, a permanent peace. The question is, how do you build trust? Trust, like reputation, is very hard to build. And once you have trust and reputation built, it is very easy to destroy. Sometimes it only takes one event to make the whole thing collapse. To give you an example of where apologies haven't worked, Germany, after World War II, apologized to the Western nations and the Eastern nations and to the Jewish community. And they did it in a sincere manner to the point where Germany is accepted by European countries and by the Jewish people in Israel as a true friend. The same has not occurred with, J with Japan. Japan never apologized to Korea for what they did and they never really apologized to China for what they did. And China and Korea, as a result, still do not trust Japan. So for an apology to work, it has to be one that's trusted and sincere. And neither side sees that right now. And the question is, how do we build, not only between Israel and Palestine, but also wherever there is conflict, the kind of trust that allows for respect of the values of the other side, now, of course, sometimes values are so incompatible that there is no resolution. Nazi values were completely incompatible with 
democratic values, or even other kinds of authoritarian values. The Nazis simply wanted to enslave most of the world and to exterminate not only Jews, gypsies, Slavs, or anyone else they felt to be inferior. Therefore, there was no alternative but to fight the Nazis. But that's not the way most of the world is. Most people want what you all want. They want to feel fairly safe, fairly secure. They want their children and their parents to feel safe and secure. But as George Orwell said in a wonderful, you can go on the internet, a one-page review of Mein Kampf, he said, but it's wrong to think that all people want is comfort and safety and security and hygiene and health care. People also want, at least intermittently, something to believe in, something that transcends who they are alone in this world. And that's what Mr. Hitler has understood. And that's why his message has been so powerful. Unfortunately, it's been a dangerous and killing message. But there must be other messages out there, like those of Gandhi or Martin Luther King, that at least can compete with that kind of adventure, intellectual adventure, emotional adventure, and desire. And I'll end it there. Thank you. So first of all, I love Istanbul, an amazing city. If you were dropped with your eyes closed, you come into Istanbul, you're like, oh, might be heaven, beautiful place. Um, this university is also a fascinating place. Um, I love the, the unbridled talent of university students, and so it's so refreshing to actually be able to um, work with students um, if you, um, with the, the future that you have. And so hopefully we can help you today. Um, I also look for uh, people who have done amazing things in life. Um, your founding professor here has done an amazing thing with this university and it is awe-inspiring. And so you should be, uh, you should look at him uh, with, these, with these eyes. Uh, my wife tells our friends a joke. She says to them, it's a good thing that he's getting better looking because he's not getting any funnier. And so I have to live with this sort of um, abuse in my, my home. <laughs> and it shapes the way that I think about the world around me. Um, and I'll come back to why I bring up the idea of humor in just a moment. But to give you an idea of what is possible within the talent that sits in the room, um, one of the things that, that our research teams have done is we go to the field, we try to understand people that are in conflict, we go talk to them on each side, and you'll be surprised how few people actually go do this. We thought that there would be um, that we would run into other teams in the field, uh, other research teams doing the same thing, and, and we find that there are very few people that have enough courage to go into challenging environments and do this work. And so as a function of that, we've been in a lot of different countries, met with a lot of different enemy combatants, a lot of different groups that support enemy combatants, a lot of uh, groups that are um, some call terrorists, some call freedom fighters, we've been with them. And we do experimentally designed studies with them. That is, we try to understand um, very difficult things, like under what condition might somebody strap a bomb to their chest? And under what condition might they not do that or not want to do that anymore? Um, these are important sort of foundational things uh, that we have been studying and working through so that we could develop very fine instruments when we go to the field to try to be able to, as the whole idea of science is to try to be able to provide some sort of perspective and maybe even prediction about the future based upon certain fundamental uh, things that nature tells us, like the, coming from these instruments that, that we have designed. 
Why this has become important is because it has allowed us as a research team to actually engage in the world of artificial intelligence and understand artificial intelligence. So I know without asking you that every one of you sitting in here has one of these in your pocket. And many of you have probably looked at it um, you know, during the course of the time that we've been together or you will look at it many, many times today. So fundamentally what's happening with this little machine, which is stronger than even some of the spaceships that we had go up to the moon, right? This little machine now is shaping the way that you think about the world around you. So how is it doing it? Well, whether you call it social media platforms or whether you call it YouTube, what, whatever news sources or whatever information sources that you digest today, many of them are coming through this vehicle. And so then that leaves an opportunity for private sector companies to figure out exactly what it is that you look at, why you look at it, how long you spend looking at it, and to try to provide you information and feed you information that allows them to earn money, to grow their own uh, company, to try to get you to buy things, to try to, try to get you to go to things. Now this has become a fundamental uh, battleground for the future of how societies think and what is, um, how countries even see each other. And so our research teams not only go to the field now, but we have um, advanced work in the artificial intelligence space. And I can assure you that based upon what we know and what we see is that one of the most intractable problems that we have today is coming as a function of how influence is changing. Personal and collective influence is happening as a function of the preferences that you have because of this, ve this vector. It's allowing you to receive information faster and more quickly than at any other time in human history. And so as, as we think about this, these field studies and why somebody would actually want to strap a bomb to their chest, these fundamental human uh, values we find critically important in the shaping of artificial intelligence. The interesting thing is that ChatGPT, and I'm sure none of you are using ChatGPT or GPT-4 to write your, your papers for your classes. I'm sure of it. <laughs> but yet, these tools are now part of us and part of the future, but what's interesting about them is that they lack um, some very fundamental rudimentary things about what, how human beings work. They don't understand, for example, the difference between value structures that you may have and what you hold important. Um, they may not understand the difference in language between southeastern Turkey and Istanbul. You know, the, the inflections, the idioms, the, the, these types of things. And so as a function of this, we find that uh, the deployment of artificial intelligence is likely going to change um, in, to where it has much more cognitive and cultural and behavioral aspects to it. Um, and, and that's what we are on the frontier of at the center at Oxford where, where we're trying to define these things. It has gotten to the point where we have even developed our own GPTs that allow for this sort of cultural and, and, and, and collective um, understanding of finite groups, different groups in the way they view things. We're even so far as now to try to see if we can make a GPT that actually is funny, where it can use local humor, local idioms to be able to feed back to you and to get you to laugh. This is the hardest thing in artificial intelligence, and it is the frontier. Now, why is this important? Because nation states are weaponizing it today. And we have been watching nation states weaponizing it, and we have now watched armed groups weaponizing um, information um, through these same algorithm development things. And the, the sort of challenging things, and we would put this, and I would put this at around 24 to 36 months before we begin to see a real concerted effort by organized crime to use artificial intelligence um, in ways that um, profits them. Even yesterday, uh, President Putin was shown a 
uh, likeness of himself, a video likeness of himself saying whatever the AI machine was programmed to have it say. Because we want you to have the opportunity to ask questions, I'm going to just leave you with one fundamental thing for you to consider. The, everything that you've heard on the stage today is possible for you to work on and you to shape the future of the world. It is possible, but you just have to believe it's possible and you have to work hard enough to get there. Nobody's going to give you anything. And effort means a great deal. And good effort means more. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your uh, contributions and debates. Uh, I mean, when I was listening to you, I um, uh, I thought that there are some recurrent themes in history in terms of crisis. I mean, many philosophers or artists, etc., et have uh, talked about you know the rise and fall of value systems the crisis in value systems and uh, you know um, or new uh, you know power, power uh, blocks are rising and you know threatening the prevailing international order etc etc uh, from the early modern history from the enlightenment uh, process or pre-modern history like your reference to the handun etc uh, and i tried to figure out what was so special about our current you know crisis is there anything that you know every generation has its own concept of crisis i don't remember uh, you know two consecutive decades in history uh, where there was no talk of crisis when i think of that especially the modern history uh, do you think that there's something special in our current crisis not maybe not in terms of you know the structures of crisis uh, but in the perceptions of I mean, how, how do we, uh, in, in terms of how we perceive the crisis? For instance, I think of the artificial intelligence thing, and uh, I thought that, yeah, this is, this is the novelty, this is a very new thing in human history. Then I remembered the, you know, the artistic and philosophical debates in the early 20th century about the human-machine interaction and all the fascinations and uh, the, the people terrified and fascinated about this, you know, risks and potentials, the utopias and dystopias about this, uh, the, the science fiction, etc. So it is not totally new neither. So can you pinpoint something which is, you think is you know, unique in our current uh, crisis in terms of perception? That's, that's a, great, uh, a great point. So let me just give you, with respect to what Bob was saying, um, two sort of historical structures. What he was describing about China and the United States has been known in political theory as the Thucydides trap. Yeah. The Greek, the Greek warrior philosopher Thucydides said that the war between Sparta and Athens was almost inevitable because you had a great power being challenged by a rising power, and when that happens, the great power doesn't want to cede to the rising power, and war almost inevitably follows. Now the question is, and that has been repeated throughout history, the question is, well, what does that mean in the 21st century between China and the United States? Of course, a general war is almost unthinkable, but are we de destined for the Thucydides trap? Because of the nuclear issue, it seems, again, almost imaginable. But if those structural conditions maintain, then it might be unavoidable. So that's something to think about. Another interesting thing is what you talk about, uh, the sort of new social media that is part of the globalized world we live in. But people often don't realize that after the fall of Napoleon, after the Napoleonic Wars, for almost a century, from 1815 to 1915, despite glo local wars, regional wars, an area of globalization occurred far surpassing anything else in human history. Human history had been built on muscle power and wind power, and that's it. Animals, bodies, and the wind. All of a sudden, you had machines. And within less than 100 years, you had airplanes, you had telephones, you had telegraphs, you had 
steamships, you had industrial might. In fact, the pace of globalization between 1870 and 1950 surpassed even today. The flow of money, globalized monies across the world in 1912 wasn't achieved again because it had stopped with World War I and World War II until the 1990s. So you had a fully globalized system that collapsed and took almost a century to reconstitute. The question is, we are witnessing today something very similar. We had an international order, mostly through American hegemony after World War II and the international system, that looks on the verge of collapsing. What will that mean? Because unlike those previous days, we now have social media, which represents something quite new. We have something that is the opposite of the clash of civilizations. We have the collapse of civilizations. As the vertical relationships between the elder and younger generation are sundered, and young people look across the world through ever narrow bands of information to connect up with one another. And so the wisdom of generations is now being lost in globalized communities, and young people are flailing around across transnational communities looking for connections, music, art, science, political theories, and we don't know where that is going and how that is going to affect the world other than the fact that it seems to be orthogonal or even destructive of the nation state. So while we do see things in history repeating itself, we do see very novel things happening in the world today that we don't know answers for. And if you ask us, you know, what will happen, I'm sure my colleagues, my friends have answers, but as for me, um, I look to my astrology chart. That's, <laughs> that's about it. Another recurring theme. <laughs> okay. I, I, I have something to say about that. I, I think we're at a unique time right now in the age of discovery. Um, if human beings can harness uh, large language models and machines and artificial intelligence capabilities, we can discover what's inside the mind. We can discover many things about the universe that we don't currently know. And the types of things that you're working on, the disciplines that you're studying at present, um, have an opportunity for brand new expansion that hasn't been done before because of the amount of data processing that's possible now. But all of this must be done in a disciplined manner, a scientifically disciplined manner, and programs uh, with morality being involved, and that's, that's its own problem set. But I see it as an amazing time in the future of humanity right now. Any questions and contributions? Yeah. Who holds Hello, my name is Hazal. I'm studying political science and international relations, and I'm doing my double major with new media and communications. First of all, thank you for all coming here. It was very valuable listening your opinions on the topic. Uh, I think we all agree that United Nations lost its function. But personally, I'm not saying we should abolish it. Uh, because today, if we abolish United Nations, we don't have any other organization that is ready to put United, uh, a representative from each country into a building less than an hour. We don't have any. So, in Security Council permanent members, there is no Muslim country member or a Turkey country member, so, which is a problem too, in my opinion. Uh, so it looks like a solution is going to going into a change in United Nations organization. So my question is, when and how you think these changes will happen in the United Nations? Um, as you know, the five major powers after World War II enshrined in the United Nations the right to veto any required actions by others. 
they're not going to give that up. And therefore, while the United Nations is likely to evolve, for example, the role of peacekeeping forces has evolved and has become more extensive in ability to uh, monitor uh, um, situations where a conflict has ended but might start again. The United Nations peacekeeping forces have often been very helpful in preventing things from starting again by monitoring the situation. Um, but, and the United Nations might well um, have a larger security council allowing more countries um, to be uh, rotating members without a veto. But unfortunately, um, the five countries that have a veto are never going to give it up. And so that limits the authoritative power of the United Nations to those situations where these five countries can agree, or at least not uh, assert a disagreement, which is, of course, uh, rules out um, major issues, like shall we have a ceasefire in Gaza uh, if the United States vetoes it. The, United Sta um, um, the General Assembly can still express a, wild, uh, a very widespread uh, world uh, view by most countries that there should be an immediate ceasefire, but it can't be, but the United Nations cannot um, require it. And uh, so its, its growth is limited, but it's still, as you say, the only um, institution that, that has representation for the whole world. However, there are some alternative institutions. Uh, there are social movements, like the women's movement, to take one example, or climate uh, activism. There's also economic organizations, such as um, very large corporations that have um, a very substantial power on their own. There's also uh, alliances between countries, whether they're oil-producing countries in OPEC, or for example, NATO countries that work together. So there is institutional development, um, but, uh, and it's a slow process based on learning lessons of what doesn't work and what's needed, such as um, the organization of new economic institutions of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund after World War II, which have been quite effective in managing financial uh, transactions between the countries. Um, and I think it's an uh, important part of the development of these international institutions that citizens such as yourself can play a role in developing social movements, whether it be, for example, for women or for a climate or for human rights or for peace in uh, particular situations, that these bottom-up um, mass movements can actually have an effect in reflecting the changing values in the world. And I hope that you uh, uh, are inspired to take part in whatever one of those suits your interests. Another question. Yes. Uh, well, hi, my name is Asma. I'm studying also political science and international relations uh, with a double major in psychology. I found your uh, speech really interesting, especially in the part of your experimental designs, in which you mentioned uh, the, when you tried to study between uh, Palestinians and Israelis, especially the part that I found so interesting is you said revenge and joy in their part of the brain is different from pe normal people. The people with suicide, suicidal bombings and the revenge and joy part in their brain is different from others. But how exactly can we say that comes from? Is it something they were born with or is it something that they cultivate later? In, in which period of the time did they cultivate? It? And thank you. No, they're not different. It, what, what I was saying was that um, when people uh, support suicide bombing, revenge, for example, we did a study with the uh, Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research where um, support for suicide bombing went up in the general population, not just suicide bombers, the general population, whenever checkpoint, I don't know if you've ever, well, you probably have never experienced an Israeli checkpoint, but it's quite harrowing. When the time waiting in the checkpoint, the humiliations of the checkpoint in the West Bank, just to be in clear. the West Bank, increased 
uh, no, also in the Eretz crossing in Gaza. Yeah. Uh, when they increased support for suicide bombing among the general population, increased. And what we found in the brain scans was that revenge, well, they expressed behaviorally revenge, but the brain pathways, the neural pathways, were the same as joy pathways. So what that's saying is that revenge is, the old saying, revenge is sweet, because it actually is a joyful thing. The brain treats it as a joyful thing. In other brain scans, what we find is when you, oh, let me give you another thing we did in a brain, in brain scan, in neuroscience. Um, so we had a, what's called a game of cyberball. It's a game of soccer but it's on a screen. And so the people about to go into the brain scanner see this game of cyberball. And in this game of cyberball, there are Western um, players, Rich and Bob and Scott and all these others. And there is also Muslim players, Ahmed, Mohammed, and Camille, and they're playing. And all of a sudden, the Muslim players are excluded in the game. And then we find out how people are reacting in the scanner to this sudden exclusion. And what we find is um, not only belief of discrimination, but willingness to fight die and die for values they think now are under threat. Not for values like wearing the veil, which they don't think of sacred, but for things like representative of uh, pictures of the Prophet Muhammad. People start to hunker in on their own values that are most important to them and to be willing to fight for them, to die for them, and even kill them when they feel they're being ignored. Now their values weren't being ignored, but they were being socially ignored. They were being excluded from the Bali politic. Now we don't only find this with respect to, um, we did this with far right people as well uh, in the United States and Spain. Uh, we've done it all over the world with different groups. The same reaction occurs when you feel um, you're excluded. When you feel your values are being ignored, who you are being ignored, you attach to your values even more strongly and you begin to um, support violence much more strongly. So what it's telling us, we, look, we did studies of suicide bombers across the world. You can see the studies in Wikipedia, for example. We found no difference between suicide bombers and other people in terms of their basic psychology. They span the normal distribution. That is, you find some real nutcases, some real brilliant people, but most of the people are normal on all other measures. We find that the greatest predictor for whether you're going to become a suicide bomber or not is who your friends are, not your family, who your friends are, what groups you belong to, chat groups, soccer teams, uh, paintball teams, and whether or not you feel you're being excluded from whatever culture you're being excluded from. Good question. Um, yes, <laughs> but um, there is a great danger uh, with artificial intelligence uh, being deployed without programmability. It must be programmed by human beings. 
Without that, the dangers increase significantly. But even with programmability by human beings, as you've heard already, some human beings are aggressive, some are passive. And so the programmability of artificial intelligence um, will follow that sort of pathway. And the objective of what I've tried to communicate with you all is that you could shape the future of it right now if you work towards that. Where it's shaping your pathways today through your phone, as an example, and the types of things that you look and watch, you should just recognize that oftentimes the algorithms that are being developed by people that are trying to profit from you are being developed in a way to um, work towards your confirmation bias. They work towards the values that you hold dear currently, and they try to threaten those values in a way to mobilize you to do something. Buy something, go somewhere, do something. This is going to become a much more acute problem, uh, particularly when uh, the profit motives and the technology filters its way down into uh, the hands of individuals and uh, small groups that can profit as a function of using these tools. I'd like to add something. Um, I worry more about the weakness of artificial intelligence than about its strength. And let me explain. We could take the example of self-driving cars. When it's a normal situation that the data is based on, uh, it, it can do a very good job, perhaps even better than human drivers. It doesn't get drunk, it doesn't get tired. It has faster reflexes. But if it faces an unusual situation, a human is often better at understanding the context and adapting on the spur of the moment to something it's never seen before. Artificial intelligence so far, and for the foreseeable future, which is not very far ahead, uh, can make dramatic mistakes uh, for situations that it hasn't seen before. And so, uh, or misinterprets as something it has seen, but it's actually different. And so, um, and rather than displacing humans, I think the problem is equally, or maybe more, that the humans will rely too much on it. They'll uh, uh, give it uh, a th uh, responsibility to make choices, uh, in which is usually uh, could often be better than humans, say, in medical diagnosis, to take an example. Uh, but on occasion, especially when it's a situation that hasn't been trained for, something unusual, um, it could be fragile, that is to say, it could break, and it could be um, confident in the wrong, for the wrong reasons. So as I say, I think we have to be as alert to its weakness as to its, um, as to its strengths. We, we learned in the, in the last, uh, there are several states that deploy artificial intelligence for facial recognition uh, through CCTV and oftentimes they're looking for criminals. And we are aware of instances in which innocent human beings have been accused of wrongdoing as a function of the AI making a false claim about an individual. These systems are going to be deployed at scale in the coming few years, everywhere. And so this is why we need people that are interested in controlling the AI system and programming it so that there is, um, it, it supports human decision making, doesn't make it for them. I, I would recommend whatever discipline you're in, philosophy, psychology, medicine, communications, that essential core part of that and a core course of it be human machine interactions because they are going to be involved in deeply, deeply, and more and more in these, in every one of your disciplines. And if you don't understand it and you can't shape it, then it will shape you. Okay, one final question, please. It's only the ladies asking questions. Yeah. So Most of the guys have left. <laughs> I'm the two chairs for the jump. Öncelikle değerli katılımlarınız için çok teşekkür ederim. Ben de siyaset bilimi ve uluslararası ilişkiler öğrencisiyim. 
E, benim sorum şu şekilde. E, aslında bir nevi cevap vermiş olduğunuz gibi ama ben özellikle bu hususta merak ettim. E, ulus devletlerin eğitilebileceği bir sistem yok demiştiniz. E, ve aynı zamanda yapay zekanın çok daha farklı yerlere evrilebileceğinden de bahsetmiştiniz. Sizce ulus, ulus devletleri eğitebilecek sistemi yak, yapay zeka gerçekleştirebilir ya da insanlara bu konuda destek sağlayabilir mi eğitimliği müddetçe? Teşekkür ederim. I think um, artificial intelligence can be very useful um, for improving the educational system of our schools. For example, uh, lessons can be adapted to the capacity of the individual uh, to see what uh, they don't understand and provide a lesson that um, is adapted to that individual and that individual's way of absorbing new information. So I expect that uh, our ability to train uh, or educate people right up from kindergarten right through graduate school will be substantially assisted by artificial intelligence. Now you ask about nations. That's harder. Um, artificial intelligence might be helpful in having nations learn how other, how each other sees things, for helping Americans see how Turks see things, and for Turks to see how Chinese see things, and so on. Um, because maybe it can, um, for example, certainly in the language, it, it, it can help, uh, already we see translations which are not ideal and not up to human standards, but for many purposes are really quite helpful. Um, and maybe it could get to the point where um, when one country makes a demand, with the artificial intelligence can make us understand a little better what's behind it. For example, as Scott says, it's often about values, even if it's expressed as something about territory or about military or economic things. Uh, it would be better if we could also understand what is the motivation, what are the values that are being expressed, and how does that relate to our values? And in, in particular, could they be reconciled? Do they have to be uh, even if it's posed as a zero-sum conflict, I want what you have, and um, uh, it, it, uh, maybe artificial intelligence can often help us by understanding what's behind that, what values are at stake, to see that maybe there are ways um, to, um, to deal with it. For example, to respect each other. I'll give you an example. Not artificial intelligence, but about respect that we, we could cross cultures. Uh, as you may know, the United States and the Soviet Union had a hotline after the, to talk to each other when there's a crisis. The United States also developed that with China, more recently. But when there was a problem, and the United States sent a message to China about it, the Chinese didn't answer. And this happened a number of times. And in fact, American military leaders talked to Chinese military leaders and asked them about this and said, well, we wish you would uh, use this uh, communication channel so that we can understand each other at the times when we're, um, it has potential conflict. And when I raised this with some Chinese experts in Shanghai, the answer I got was interesting. It said, when somebody, ins and these are exact words because they made a big impression. When somebody insults you, you don't want to talk to them. And then he said, well, that may be a cultural thing with us Chinese. The next day I thought, you know, I should have said, if there's a cultural universal, it might well be that, that when somebody insults you, you don't want to talk to them. So I think, um, in artificial intelligence might help us a little bit understanding each other. Um, to take an extreme example of this, again, with the United States and China, when the Chinese fired missiles um, over Taiwan and uh, the United States wanted to support Taiwan, we sent an aircraft carrier to show that we were serious. The Chinese noticed that the name of the aircraft carrier was the USS Independence. It was called independence. That was the aircraft carrier that was in the region. The Chinese said, you're dealing independence in Taiwan? You're putting those together? 
are you saying that Taiwan should be independent? Of course, for the Americans, this was silly. It was it happened to be the aircraft carrier. It was referring to American independence from Britain. But they saw it as possibly a, uh, a, uh, an insult and an assertion about the United States promoting Taiwan independence, which, of course, it was nothing of the kind. And I hope that artificial intelligence could help us um, realize that some of these mistakes that we make of interpretation are really mistakes. For example, that the aircraft carrier happened to be the one that was nearby. So Bob is talking about how artificial intelligence might help us disambiguate. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll just give you one example, maybe that should be the last one, about trust. So we were trying to deal with negotiations between the Iranians and the Americans on nuclear weapons, that is, to get the Iranians to give up nuclear program. And in these talks, we talked to them, Saudis, Israelis, Iranians, all these different, and two very different notions of what trust is emerged. For the Americans and the Europeans, trust was a sort of managerial trust, competence, honesty, validation, checking. For the Iranians, that was mistrust. You have to constantly validate. You have to constantly figure out if we're competent or honest or not. Their idea of trust was much more familial trust. In your family, you trust your parents. You trust your kids. Sometimes they may even lie a little bit. Sometimes they may not be so competent. Sometimes they may not do exactly what you think, but you're not constantly monitoring because you know but because they're your family, you can trust them. And because things, if things get bad, you can count on them. That is not a conception of trust in American or European foreign policy or in the International Monetary Fund or in American industry. It is a serious aspect of trust in the rest of the world. So one of the problems we have, even in science, I don't know if you've heard this notion weird, Okay, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and developed countries. Almost all theories, academic theories, and experiments are from that point of view. That happens to be weird because most of the world doesn't think like that. And so what this ambiguation and artificial intelligence might be doing if properly programmed is say, uh-oh, signal, warning, you're you're doing this from a weird point of view. You better consider these other points of view. And that certainly could help um, de-conflict situations in the world. Okay, the, the discussion is so inspiring that it's impossible to, you know, uh, let it uh, continue to uh, wait it, it to cease. <laughs> so someone needs to stop it. It's on me, I think, my job. So we want to thank you all uh, very much, very deeply for your contribution and for joining us here. In Let me say one thing, and, and I, I hope I speak for you. If, if, if, I know we're out of time, but if anybody wants to stay a little longer, come up and ask. We're more happy than to, to, okay. to carry on. Can you continue? You don't have to right here. Here. go away? He's saying that uh, students can come ask questions if they want. Afterward. Okay, Afterward. then we Afterward. can continue, yeah. if, you, if you like. I mean, the end of the session, people need to go. Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, but before that, for uh, I mean, you are able to uh, approach and ask questions if you like, perfect questions if you like. But before that, uh, we want to uh, give you some uh, humble gifts by, you know, uh, by our director, uh, Professor uh, Tarhan. Uh, we want to offer you some credits. Uh, so, please. Thank you very much. Good. Those are good questions.
Thank you. 